Hey, good evening. Um, hope uh, everybody is feeling fine. I just had some good tunes by Gogo Penguin, one of my favorite uh, jazz trios. Um, keeps me going for the show. That was a long day, but uh, I'm very happy to do this episode tonight because um, it's about one of my favorite topics. It's about uh, writing and the way to write with your computer. And um, well, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, I guess many people in the world do this with traditional word processors, as I would call them. And uh, this might be Microsoft Office, uh, like uh, Word or LibreOffice, which in fact is uh, nobody that I know is using that program. But it's great. It's a great substitute for Microsoft Word. But I think people most of the times have problems to uh, just um, exchange documents with folks that do the Microsoft stuff. And uh, I think the conversion or the, the format conversion from uh, LibreOffice and Microsoft Word has become much, much better after the fork from uh, OpenOffice, which in my opinion is not being developed up to date. And uh, still, LibreOffice is not something that in my environment, social environment, is the tool to go. Uh, many people say, well, I, I open it up and it's it's completely uh, not like I'm used to have Microsoft Word. And I understand that because when I um, chose GIMP instead of Photoshop, which was the graphical tool which uh, I started with, um, I thought the same. Everything is somewhere else and I cannot find uh, this or that button or function or whatever. And so um, I understand this. And, well, I tried a lot of tools to write for education and for science, also LibreOffice, and also a tool on Mac called Scrivener, which brought me to Markdown, which brought me to LaTeX, and uh, which uh, is a great tool for arranging stuff when you're, ra when you're creatively writing, like uh, stage plays or um, fiction. But... Um, this brought me to LaTeX, of course. I had to learn this because I thought, uh, well, I work at a technical university and I thought they do. everybody's doing that here, which is not true. Uh, lots of people are not doing this. Um, but uh, I wanted to know how that works. And I thought, well, it has a great, it is great because it looks great and um, everything is possible that you can imagine to to uh, yeah, to put on paper or to put on the web. Well, Latex is for putting things on digital paper like PDF. But I thought it was great. But I always thought the overhead and the knowledge that you need to uh, mark up your writing is so huge. And I I always had to had to use a tool or a cheat sheet to look things up. I'm not good. I'm not very good yet with that because it's. It's more like coding and it's not like doing markup. Um, and then I was searching and searching and then I found up out a, a workflow that I want to show tonight. It's, uh, it's a markdown, it's an enhanced markdown workflow, which starts with markdown. I'm going to show markdown in a minute. And it uses Pandoc as a conversion tool. And um, with this decision, you have not to... Um, decide first what output format you want. So when you do with LaTeX, which is, uh, which is uh, um, it, uh, you make a decision, out comes a PDF, nothing else. So if you want to have, for example, a website for your educational purposes, and you also want a script to download for the students, um, you have to do the double of the work or you do it smarter, you start with Markdown and you build both out of your Markdown. And this is something that really convinced me because single source publishing for uh, yourself is a good thing, as I hope to show tonight. So um, this is a little bit my story, how I came to this, I guess, very technical and a little bit sophisticated workflow. But... Um, I found out that in talking about open science and doing uh, 
stuff that is reproducible, that is archivable, that is um, a little bit indi more independent, uh, or that is independent from, for example, companies building proprietary programs. I think it's, um, it's worth at least dealing with it to find out if it helps yourself. So let me show you this. Um, I'd like to give a short overview of uh, what we're going to do. So <clears throat> first of all, I want to give a short introduction into Markdown while I'm writing in VS Codeium. VS Codeium, as you can see here, is this editor. And um, it is nothing else than uh, what you might know. Perhaps it's Visual Studio Code. Uh, it's built by Microsoft, but it's built upon an open source base, which Microsoft brands and uh, enhances with some features. And as you can read on the website of VS Codium, it's the binary release of VS Codio, Visual Studio Code without Microsoft branding, telemetry and licensing. And this is one thing that I like, that the, it's, it's the same for Chromium compared to Chrome, it's the same model. Um, Chromium has not all the, well, tracking options uh, set in the preferences um, as, Go as Google Chrome has it. So Chromium and VS Codium are comparable because they are the open source base that companies take and brand and enhance or um, augment with their company functions. So um, VS Codium is telemetry free, which I like. I can select if I want to send anything to Microsoft or not. And uh, this is something I like also to give to my students because Microsoft Visual Studio Code is something that I spend a quarter of an hour uh, to have them check the uh, privacy aspects and the stuff. And uh, well, I'm, I'm very glad with VS, VS Codium because I don't have this hassle when I'm teaching. Now, um, nevertheless, the documentation for VS Codium, as it is, in fact, Microsoft Visual Studio Code, is here on this website. So if you want to know how to work with this editor that I really use on the surface um, in this episode, you can find a very, very good documentation. So thanks, Microsoft, for this great documentation here. Um, it's dealing with all the platforms. It's not just Windows related. It's also um, with the people in mind that have Macs, that have Linux systems. I found a lot um, that is really, I would say, empathetic. Uh, so Microsoft is not just thinking everybody has Windows. This is great. And um, well, there are some functions that I really, really uh, had to look up here. And uh, if you spend the time on this documentation, you will find out a lot what to get out of this editor. Um, final words about this editor at the moment. It is, um, it is an editor that um, I think was the successor of Atom, which was a development by GitHub. And um, well, Microsoft bought GitHub and Microsoft brought up this editor. And I would say that this is uh, the horse to ride on because Atom is very slow compared to Microsoft Visual Studio Code or VS Codium. So if you're still working with Atom, um, you should switch or you should at least try out VS Codium or Microsoft Visual Studio Code because I think it's really an improvement. It's faster and uh, the community loves it and builds extensions and extensions a lot. Well, and uh, the final um, thing here is to, in this episode is Pandoc, which is called a universal document converter. Well, it sounds like nothing fancy. It's a command line tool. It is nothing to click on. It's, uh, but it's very, very powerful as I want to show. Just on the surface, there's a, a long, long documentation, as you can see here. So no, you can see it here. It's a very long documentation. See this? It's a one pager. And um, it's full of options that makes your writing and your publishing very, very comfortable. And the, the thing is, you have to get to know, you have to get um, um, uh, into this 
um, well, it's not clicking, it's knowing the parameters. And this is something I think for most of the people using traditional word processors is new. And um, it's a learning curve that might be uh, a steep learning curve, but well, you have to decide. I would say I do an episode tonight that shows some of the features of a writing workflow for science and also for education so that you have a glimpse on what, um, what you have to expect if you're going to deal with that. So just let me check some technical stuff here. Well, it looks like everything's fine here. Let me see here. All right. So, um, right. Okay. So let's go ahead. Um, markdown in the editor. I want to open up this editor here and I've prepared a folder for everything for this episode. And I just want to start right away with, um, writing something in a file. So I click here and I call this draft.md. MD is a convention extension for uh, markdown files. And as you can see, it opens up here and then I can write something. I write uh, the title of this episode, setting up a scholarly um, writing environment with markdown vs codium well and pandoc well that's is what we're going to talk about well i make this a little bit bigger here now we need some text um i have a nice plugin that's called lorem ipsum and it inserts four paragraphs so that there is a little bit of text here all right so um I absolutely understand the folks that say, well, this is the environment you write in. This does not look like what I'm used to. Well, sure. And it will get worse as you will see. So this is not the concept of WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. This is more like a code environment. It's people who code are used to having the signs and characters directly in their face that they are writing. There's no WYSIWYG like in Word. It's always a process of I write code and then I compile it, it's being interpreted or it's being rendered or whatever you call it. So there's a process involved that makes B out of A. And uh, this is something you have to get used to, but not really, because I would say if this is the requirement of people who want to change that they have something like WYSIWYG, there should be a way. And um, a characteristic of many tools today is that work with Markdown is that they have on the left hand side, they have the Markdown and on the right hand side, they have something like a preview page, which is uh, the case with HackMD, for example. HackMD is uh, an online editor uh, for collaborative writing, which is great. I use it every day with colleagues and um, uh, in school uh, with with parents, I use it. It's great. And um, it has the same principle. On the left-hand side, it's Markdown. On the right-hand side, it's the preview. So how do we get this here? Do we get something like um, a preview? Well, there is one here. And um, as you can, perhaps you can read here, it's called Markdown Preview Enhanced. Open preview to the side. There's also a preview tab that I can hit here, it looks like that. Okay, so this is not really an improvement. It's not so codey, but it is not really a nice page. And many people I talk to about um, switching to um, other writing environments, they say they love the white paper-like thing because it's inspiring, it's what they grew up with. Okay, right, so let's close this. There's a better way of showing a preview. So if I click here, you can see, <coughs> excuse me, you can see here, there's something like a white paper, it's bigger, and it looks, it looks better. So and it's, it's that huge, because I blew up this uh, zoom function here. So if I go this way, well, it looks quite nice. 
Um, so this is it for the moment. Um, this is quite okay. And it has some nice function, this extension. I want to show you how to install it and what you get from it. Um, but if you click, uh, if, you, if you do a right click here, you see you can open it in the browser. So if I do this, open in browser, the browser, the standard browser of your system goes up and you have a clear view of a pre-formatted HTML page. So let's have a look behind it. Well, it is obviously a well-formatted page with CSS included and our text here. So nice. This is what you get. So um, what else? You can have an HTML download. You can have a PDF by a headless browser concept with Chrome and Puppeteer. I never use it because I have Pandoc. Um, you can have Pandoc here, which is nice but it's a little black boxy. I want to show you uh, what's behind this, uh, what's behind the scene. And you have an image helper, which is nice. I'm going to show you the image helper later on. Um, so how do you get this extension? I think it's absolutely necessary to have it because it has so many great features. This is one of it. So let's see. Um, in VS Codium, on the left-hand side, you go to the extensions tab and you type enhanced which is, uh, as I learned, then the first result in the result list. Now, this is it, Markdown Preview Enhanced. It's by a Chinese guy, uh, which I mentioned because in the settings there's um, a Chinese cloud platform, which I had to look up, uh, which is not useful for us because um, most of the things are written in Chinese language. Uh, this is the only thing I mentioned that. Um, this, is, uh, this is a cool... Um, extension which uh, which a website of its own so if i click here i open up the official page and as you can see here it is for atom and it's for vs code um it's it's very very old uh well in uh in uh internet years so then if you go to github you will find um, documentation of its own, which I think was built with the help of Markdown Preview Enhanced. So I put the links in the in the recording afterwards. Uh, you will find what I click here. You will find it afterwards. So what you need to know to get most out of it is this official documentation of the extension pack, um, which is not so, as you can see, not so huge. But what you really need to get most out of it is this one here. Because it's not just for the Pandoc thing, it's also for building presentations. You can have diagrams in that. You, have, you can also have executable code in what you're doing here. So it's great. We're just having uh, a little bit, a tiny bit of that. So this is what you need to install. I go to back, I go back to VS uh, Codium and you would click here, install, which I have already done. Afterwards, you have a new extension pack here. All right, let's see what we can get out of that. Um, let's write some Markdown. Markdown, for example, has um, easy ways for formatting. Let's see, let's uh, put this in bold type. And as you can see, this preview tab updates immediately. If you want to force an update, click this one. If you want to have a table of contents, you have this one here. And if you are at the bottom and you want to go up, you click on this button here. Well, um, if you want to know how Markdown, how the basics of Markdown work, there's a website for that. It is, for example, this very, very easy page by GitHub. It's, um, it's a website that uh, gets you going it is for um, it is for beginners and so there is something that we might use here so let's copy this one and go back here well I have to switch this on again now what if we put this here all right so it gives us an example of bold italic and a link so this is nice so this is the way you write a link but um, for scientific or for educational purposes, you would need an image here. So um, 
let's get us an image and see how this easily works. Because, for example, you want to have an image that comes from uh, the internet or you want to have it in the same folder here. So let us see how we can do this. I go to placekitten.com, which is always nice to have. So let's build an image that might fit. It's, um, we need it 800 by 200. This is the kitten that we get. All right, so I save this in the folder that I prepared here. Let's call it kitten JPEG. All right, so um, there it is. Now, how do we get pictures here? Well, we do it with an exclamation mark with brackets and parentheses. This is the syntax of images, for images, to, to link to images. So, let's say a kitten. And it's kitten.jpg. Well, this is a nice function. I don't know when this came and why, but if you type and you get a suggestion for a, a file or a picture, it gives you a preview, which is nice. So I hit enter, and there it is. So this is what we have in the, in the preview tab. But um, this is not really what I want because, uh, um, no, this is what I want, but I want something like uh, more functions or more aspects that, I, that I'm used to from writing with uh, professional tools, well, like Word, if it's a professional tool, but it has some functions that everybody's used to, like citing or a reference list, table of contents, and, um, for example, cross-references within the document or captions below the images or figures. And this is something that we, of course, can have here, but we need some preparation for that. And I want to show you that because this is a very simple document. You can write it in HackMD as well. This is nothing fancy. I would suggest that we do something fancy right now. So, for example, I want to have... Um, references here. This, which is which is really the thing that uh, makes scientific or scholarly writing, um, yeah, <laughs> what it is. You reference other articles. So how can this be done? Um, let's have a look at the Pandoc documentation because the way that we're gonna cite here is something that you really have to well, have a cheat sheet for, as I have, or you do it as often as you can and have it in mind. But I have to admit that I have always have to look up some of the syntax because there are some specialties that, when I write the next thing, I have to look up again. Well, I think this is normal. So let's have a look at this huge documentation, the user's guide, and let's have a look at citations on the website. As you can see here, it's footnotes, which is something that we're going to deal with in the next uh, next thing, and citations. Well, citations, um, this is the technical stuff that we need afterwards. We, we're coming to that. But how do we write um, a citation? And, well, it is quite easy if you know what to do. It's always an at sign, an at character, referring to some key that might stem from a biblatech or biptech file. So to give you an example how that works, um, we need such a file. And uh, I've prepared something in Zotero. This is a dummy library that I set up just to show you some not overwhelming list. It's just two references here. And I want to download this to show you citing and building reference list afterwards. So let's click on this one here and hold the shift key and click on another one. This is the thing that you have to do is normal selection by um, uh, control and shift to build the list. And then you go on this one, it's export. I don't understand why this arrow goes up. I think it should go down, but I don't care. Um, you click export 
and then you choose this one. And you're asked where to put it. Well, I put it in the same folder that we have here, and I call it bibliography.bib. That's it. So, um, should be visible here. Yeah, that's it. Okay, right. So, I close this just to get your attraction for the Biblatic file. I click on this here, and this is what you can see. Um, it's, um, it's a format that uh, most of the great programs uh, like, um, uh, what is this, Evernote? Uh, no, 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 it's EndNote. Uh, sorry, it's EndNote. It's um, Citavi. They can export it. So it's, um, it's a common format. It's nothing special related to Pandoc or something. It's a, it's a normal format. But it's, um, well, it's interchangeable between platforms. It's very old and it's very solid. Uh, it's not the best that you can have, but it works. I work with that. Might be better ones. I use this one. As you can see, there are some there's some information in this, like an um, abstract or the title. This is what it is. And this is the key that we need to work with our citation reference thing. So I close this and I'm going to use this here. No, sorry, I don't close this. I need this one here. I have to copy this to show you how to use it. So let's say this paragraph is by this guy. And this is what we have to do to put the brackets, the add character, and the key. And you might think, well, this is much easier in the traditional word processor that I'm working with. Yes, it is. Because if you have the Citavi plugin or you have the Sotero plugin, it, it's very, very intuitive. It's, it's good. Nothing against that. But if you want, if you don't want to decide that you want to have a Word document at the end, and this might also be a PDF document because you can save a Word document as a PDF document, you want to be flexible with what comes out of this. You perhaps might want in a modern way, you want, might want an HTML file, you might want a JATS XML file, and you want a PDF, and perhaps you want to send someone a Word document because the review process is something that goes by Word forward and backward. You want to be flexible and you want to be open for future things to come. And you want to learn today something that perhaps might get useful when machines do text mining and you want to be in the play, in the game. So my point is, this seems to be complicated, but it also might work um, for different formats. So with this complex or complicated syntax, as, as it looked like, um, single source publishing begins. I'm going to show you with two document types that come out of this document, document later, um, and you don't have to change anything. This is great, I think. But um, this copying backwards and forwards and knowing the key and the syntax and stuff, I want this a little bit more comfortable. There's a way with an extension pack we're going to install this in a minute. But first of all, how does, how does the preview look like with this? I click here, as I did before. Well, it didn't care. It didn't care. Because in the default settings here, the Markdown Preview ex ex Enhanced extension, um, it doesn't understand this syntax. We have to do something so that it understands this Pandoc way of citing. Now, let's go with control comma into the settings and type enhanced here. So we get a selection of every um, um, every place where enhanced is. And as you can see, there, there are 46 options for the Markdown Preview Enhanced plugin. I don't scroll through them here for uh, everything. I know that nearly at the end, the thing is that I want. So let's see. Markdown Preview Enhanced, use Pandoc Parser. Well, this is our first contact with Pandoc. It's a black box now. I haven't spoken a lot about how to use it and what it does, but let's turn it on and see what it does and then dive into it why. So I click here and I go back to the draft and um, you see nothing, nothing happened. Well, I promised it, it would get better. But as you can see, there's one thing new there is a figure caption. This was not there before, and it comes from this here. A kitten 
very sweet. If I type here, you see it's the caption. This is nice. This is one thing that we got. But to be honest, how should Pandoc or Markdown Preview Enhanced know where to look for this one here? There's no relationship to our um, bibliography. We have to tell this process here where to look. And now come, comes something new, which is also a concept that is new, but it's worth learning because it's very widespread in, well, in some contexts. I wouldn't say it's everywhere, no. But you find it more and more often. It has become some kind of convention for, the, for uh, putting metadata into documents. So it, is, it goes like this. You have to type three hyphens and another three hyphens, and it's called YAML front matter. Um, you see, you see, you get a warning by Pandoc um, because we did something wrong. I just typed this to show you what I'm talking about, but this is not the way to uh, what we have to put here. We have to put here something like a key and a value, a thing that is quite common when you're programming, what you're not doing here. This is not programming, but a key value principle. On the left-hand side, the key. On the right-hand side, the value is something that is very, very common in uh, coding or programming uh, context. So let's write this here. Bibliography. And then you have to point to bibliography.bib. And this is the way to list one or more bibliography files that you need. So let's see what happened. Oh, this is what came out of it. All right. So there is um, a citation here. And what else? See this one here. It is the right bibliographic information stemming from the reference at the bottom of our file. But it's not here. Pandoc did it for us. Well, let's give this a nice headline and you learn here the references list is always the last the final thing in the document so you can put whatever you want here as a headline if you write in German or English or whatever you can put a headline here it's the 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 final headline and underneath there is the references list all right um, this is nice this is nice but I want to be, um, I want to have something more comfortable to select um, a reference that I want to cite. So let's have the next extension pack here that helps us. We need, um, we need an extension and it's called Pandoc Citer. This is what it's called. Oh, there's a new version. Ah, I don't have it. I install it later. Um, but what's the new feature? I don't know. Well, cool. Uh, it worked fine for me, but perhaps it has some uh, convenience features. Let's see. Well, as you can see here with this little animated GIF, um, there is some... Now, there's some drop-down that you can select from and then it's being inserted. Let's try this out. I ins already installed it. I don't want to install it now because I don't know if I have to reload. I leave it. It works. Now let's see. Well, this paragraph here, <coughs> excuse me, this paragraph here is by the other guy. So, brackets, nothing happens. But now, with the add character, there's the list. Because at the top of the document, there is the link to the bibliography file. The, the new extension pack knows where to look everything up that's in the list and you select the key here. And the cool thing is you also have some kind of preview for this, also with, with scrolling. So, um, no, I didn't want to have this one. I want to have the other one. Now, so, and see, in alphabetical order, there comes the other reference at the bottom of the file. Well, for me, at this point, the whole thing makes sense. When I have this one, everything is fine. Because 
I, I, I thought this might get too complicated for this episode, but just to tell you what I have, I don't have um, this Sotero in an online library. I have the Sotero standalone version, and it has a function to export a collection. Well, what I did here manually with selecting two, um, two items in the list, you can have by right-click export collection doesn't matter how many items are in there. If it's 200, it exports the 200 in a bblati file. And the coolest thing is that you can hit a checkbox that says keep updated. That means whenever you work on the list of um, references in Sotero, it gets, after you're finished, just some seconds after, it exports automatically a new file. And this file here, gets updated. So if you're writing, if you're doing some drafting and writing and you look for literature and you store it in Zotero and uh, you, you go on writing about this, you have immediately, when you have this export keep updated thing selected, you immediately have in this file the new literature to write about it, to do an excerpt and you have it correctly cited and uh, quoted in your article. This is great for me because it's not copy and pasting some stuff um, that is uh, that you have manu to check manually afterwards. So if you do a final check, if everything in the literature is correct, if you have the DOI and everything, you go through the Sotero list of items, you correct everything, not here, in the standalone version. Here you have to do it manually and then you have to export again. But if you do this with the Sotero standalone and you have export collection keep updated, then you correct everything. And whenever you click here on um, refresh, everything will be correct here. And again, the idea is if you have, have, it, if, if you have your markdown this way, you can export this to HTML, to a Word file, and to a PDF nearly with no corrections in the text. I would say with no corrections in the text except for something that you might have to add, not change, but add in the YAML front matter. And this is fine. This is fine. So it's a little bit complicated, I guess, if you see this for the first time. but. Um, this really hit me. When I had this one here together with Sotero and it made this, I thought I never want to have something else. All right, um, this is nice. Um, let's see what we have with um, footnotes, for example. What about footnotes? Um, well, I want to have a footnote here. This is the easiest way to write a footnote. Um, you can put it right after here. See, this is... Uh, what we have, insert a paragraph. Well, this is a long footnote, but you can see here, this is what it does in the HTML. And the footnote is the final, final thing on the site, on the web, on the page. And um, if you go up here again, you can see it gets you here and it gets you back up. So there's uh, vice versa linking. Very nice. Um, if you don't like your footnote in the middle of the text, which I like because it's really close to where I put the footnote link down. There's no down here anymore. There's, it is a footnote in the output format, but when you're writing, you have your note, your footnote, really near the original paragraph. Um, I wouldn't suggest to do it, you can, of course you can do it. Uh, I put it at the end of the text, not below the references, but if you put it here, the markdown, uh, the Pandoc renderer renders the markdown and it does the same. But I wouldn't put the footnote at the end. I want to have it there where it relates to. And well, finally, it's at the bottom of the page. This is something about the footnotes. Now let's have a look at what we did in the documentation here. So let's go up again. I close this here. More about citations later. So I go to footnotes. 
Ah, there's the link. I can click on this one. And here they tell you all the various syntax ways to write footnotes. I want to spend so much time on this. You can read it here. And there's also an inline footnote like this one. Um, the one with the numbers is my favorite thing. If you want to have semantic footnotes, as you might call it, so with, with some kind of label that is speaking for itself, this is also possible. Uh, it's a good way if you have lots of footnotes, because if you have a footnote twice, the renderer gets, uh, um, gets confused. Footnotes, footnote numbers have to be unique. And this hinders you from spending, uh, of, of naming uh, the footnotes the same way. So good idea. All right, so this is about um, footnotes. Now, um, we have a lot of stuff here. But um, something which is necessary for scholarly writing, especially when you uh, deal with special citation formats, you have to, for example, format this one here. And um, this is absolutely easy to do if you know how. And I want to show you. Uh, it's uh, the citation language. Um, the citation style language, which ha is archived by Zotero. And it's very easy to set up. I'm going to show you here. This is the website, zotero.org slash styles. Um, I think it's not very well documented that you find this here. In the standalone version, there is a link, but um, I think they should promote this website uh, more clearly on their, on their main site and in the tool. And what you can have here is you can search for various styles. So we, I want an author date format. This is the filter for the author date and, for example, philosophy. Well, this is what comes out of that. Um, this is what you can have here. And if you move your mouse over this one here, uh, you get a preview of what it looks like. So I don't know if this is the style that you want or that you need. Um, well, it's good. It's a German format, obviously, with English sources. Okay, right. Now, let's let's look for the classical ones. Um, let's look for APA. Well, and let's have a look at the single space by bibliography. Well, it's okay. So if you click here, you are asked to save this somewhere. And um, I'm going to save this in the same folder that I'm working in all the time. Okay, so saved. Let's have a look here. Okay, right. Um, just checking if the stream is still working. Okay, now I have this file in my editor. And please have a last, a final look at this format so that you remark, uh, that you notice the change then. Uh, because I'm going to put some new metadata information here, which refers to the new file, CSL, and I refer to APA single spaced CSL. Okay, let's have a look. Well, this is what it looks like now. Um, it names everybody well this is what i think is in the apa when uh um you have to ha have everybody in the list every author in the list and here it goes like this uh this or this also changed so let's have a look to compare i delete this it refreshes this is the list before i'm not really sure what the citation style is uh by default i, don't, I cannot say but if i do undo here it looks like that. So that's the principle. So whenever you write for um, a certain journal and they have, for example, um, a constraint for what citation style you have to use, you can download it and go ahead, or they have it and you download theirs. Um, there's also, um, as I tried it out, there's also a citation style editor by Sotero. Um, let's see, editor. CSL, let's see, was editing CSL styles. Uh, normally, there is an editor. Well, no, editor citation 
that, that is. Okay. Well, that's it. So you search for the style, for example, APA. You get it, six edition, for example, this is popular, and then you want to edit this. This is what you get. And, well, it's still loading. Why is it loading? Oh, well, it's huge. It's loading a lot. Um, <coughs> you get an example by bibli bibliography, and you can change everything here. So if you need something special and it doesn't exist, no problem. It's all open source. You can edit this with this editor, just to nice to know, for example. OK, let's get back here. So we have some things. Um, I would say um, we 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 would like to we would like to have um, now some final formats. For example, we want to have something um, we want to have something f um, um, rendered, some file formats. For example, an HTML file and a PDF. Well, the easiest way might be to right-click here, open in browser, as I showed you before. It's nice. Uh, looks like what we saw in the preview tab, but distraction-free, everything fine. We could uh, upload this somewhere. Unfortunately, this is something that I don't like, but well, I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much about this. When I change something here, it doesn't change here. So this is, as you can see, some kind of hashy file name i don't know why it comes where it comes from but if you change something here this gets updated but this doesn't get updated this is something that is not good for my uh, opinion I, I want it different this is one reason why I, why this is not useful anymore at a certain point so this is nice thank you very much but um i want to i want to create an html file differently and this brings me to pandoc um this brings me to Pandoc because um, we have much more uh, possibilities here for um, for generating the HTML. Now let's see if this would not exist. How would we create some kind of preview? I close this here and also the settings, and then I open up something that is. For me, absolutely familiar, it's the command line. But for many people, especially in Windows computers, um, it never existed in that daily workflow, which is um, absolutely clear because Windows, for example, is a click environment, as macOS is. You click on a graphical user interface. But um, in comparison, the Mac terminal or Mac command line is much more powerful um, at first and in history it was than it is on Windows. As I learned the PowerShell on Windows 10 and I think it was Windows 7 is very powerful as well. Unfortunately the syntax what you type there is still very different and there's a Linux subsystem on Windows 10 which makes this what I'm showing here much easier but it's nothing that an everyday user, for example, with a, a computer that is owned by their firm, uh, their, by their company, uh, could easily install. So this is a little bit of pity uh, because uh, on Mac computers, the terminal, the command line is very easily accessible. On Windows, it might get a little bit difficult, but it's absolutely it's possible. So. I'm going to show this on a Linux computer, and what I'm going to show also works on a Mac. And, of course, it works on a Windows computer, but there I would suggest to set up a virtual machine, for example, with an Ubuntu, which is nice to have um, anyway, and do what I'm going to show there, I'm going to show here, there on the virtual machine. Or you spend some time and ask your administrator or someone who knows to do this in the PowerShell. works as well. All right. So how do we get how do we get something created by Pandoc? The target of this operation is to have an HTML file and a PDF file from the same source. So let's see how single source publishing with Pandoc works. I open up a terminal, which I can do this way, new terminal. It open up, opens up at the bottom. 
which is nice. It's integrated. I could also have um, a terminal open up like this. Then I had to go to the folder. This is not what I'm going to do. I want to show you that the terminal is integrated in VS Codium, which makes everything that you do this way much, much easier because you have some kind of integrated environment. All right. Um, so let's see what we have here. Let me type pandoc minus minus version. I have the latest pandoc and I installed it via repositories, which is on Linux very easy. You can have a look at the installation um, ways here, installing. It's very well documented and it's very, very easy. It has become very, very easy to install it. As you can see here, it's for everything. Um, also for Docker, so you can use Pandoc in a continuous integration pipeline, which I do every day for uh, projects. Um, I put my markdown into GitLab. And in previous episodes, I showed, I showed some kind of um, I, I showed some kind of um, ways to do that and the potential of using this with Docker. But you want to perhaps uh, want to perhaps uh, have it on Windows. So the good way is uh, with Chocolately, which a colleague of mine showed to me recently. I love it because it has the same logic as um, sudo apt-get install or uh, homebrew on Mac. It's just a simple command and it pulls Pandoc from a repository and installs it. It's great. And um, I really, really love it to have it. Um, if you want to create a PDF file, you need a LaTeX inf um, installation on your computer, which can also be done with Choco, as you can see here. So this is what you should read and do it with Choco lately if you are allowed to and you can do it because it works very, very well. All right, so installing Pandoc, I have the latest version. Now let's have a look at this file list here because now I want to make the first conversion. Okay, I clear the command line here and I type pandoc. Now comes the input file, it's draft.md and now comes some kind of a switch or an option, it's minus O and the meaning of this is now comes the output file. Well, then I want an HTML file and I write the name of the output file and the extension tells Pandoc what the conversion target should be. There's also a way to manually uh, tell Pandoc about the document type or the, the extension tells about the document type uh, that has to be converted, but this works. So let's see, <coughs> let me drink something. All right, so I hit enter Let's see what happens. Okay, there's a draft HTML file. When I click on this file here, it opens up as an HTML file here. Well, this is it. Okay, right. I want to see it somewhere. So what we can do is we can open it up in the browser. So I go to this folder and open it up in the browser. Well, this is what it looks like. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, the other one looked much better. Yes, we have to put some work into this one here. Um, for example, the citations don't work. The footnote worked. This works as well, the figure caption. The link, well, this is nothing special, but the references list is gone. Well, no wonder, um, because Markdown Preview Enhanced does something under the hood that you don't see, which is nice for the preview tab, but which is not so nice for learning um, Pandoc. So let's have an investigation of what we have here. Let's see what the markup of the HTML looks like. I, I hit um, Control U, which in this Brave browser opens up a new tab and shows me the markup. The markup, obviously, is uh, modern, but it's lacking the complete overhead of HTML. If there's no head, there's no body, it's just plain HTML, which is great, because 
if you prepare something, for example, for a WordPress blog, and you do it this way, you just have to select everything, hit copy, and paste it in the text tab of the WordPress editor, and you're done with it. Well, of course, you can do some formatting, but if you had here the complete HTML file, you had to clean something. And this is WordPress ready. I love it. It's great. And um, what we have here is, um, is uh, nice for WordPress, but I want to show you how to get a complete website. So let's get back, close this. Let's get back to the command line and put a param parameter here, which is called stand alone, which means build an HTML file that can be on its own, exists on its own without depending on something like embeddable environment or something like. So I hit this again. Um, don't worry about the warning. We, we uh, talk about this in a minute. And let's hit here, um, refresh. Well, nothing really changed, but a look at the mockup shows us we have a standalone HTML website, which is nice. Well, this is what standalone does. And here you can see the principle. Well, we get back to this warning in a minute. Here you see the principle. It's the Pando command is a command line command. And the, the number and the, the quality of the switches or parameters or as it says, arguments in other contexts, um, the arguments define what Pandoc does. So instead of, well, imagine you, 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 would, you wouldn't have this command line, you would have a graphical user interface. I guess it would be some checkboxes that you hit to set an option or not. And if you don't set an option, there's always a default here. There's also documented what the default is. But if you don't do anything, the option is default. If you put it here, like standalone, it's like checking a box in a graphical user interface. That's the idea. And there is no graphical user interface yet for that because this is very powerful for automated processes, which means that I can build a Docker pipeline with this one, which is not possible if I have a click tool because automated processes don't click somewhere. So this is very powerful because it's this way, but it's not very convenient for people because they have to know these switches by heart or have to look up the documentation. That's the thing about the command line. Well, the other thing is that, for example, um, I want to see this um, reference list again. And now comes another program. It's a very tiny one, and it's separated from Pandoc. Um, I think they want to integrate it, but now at the moment it's separate. It's called Pandoc Siteproc. So I think it's for citation processing. And you have to say here that you want to use a filter that is called Pandoc Siteproc. If I do this one, and I hit it again, uh, what's the problem? Ah, I see. Okay. I Well, I, when I tested this before, I have a problem here. I have to put, um, yeah, I have to put the complete path to Pandoc and Pandoc site proc here. That was the problem. That shouldn't happen on your installation because I have several Pandoc versions running and the site proc version is pointing to another binary than the Pandoc and so they are incompatible. This is what it says here. So let's go again with this one. Aha, this worked, except for the warning. Let's have a look here. What does it look like? If I go here again, aha, now it has the citation and the references. So what we've learned is that the filter that uses Pandoc Siteproc in combination with this metadata, metadata gets us this HTML file with the right reference list and the footnotes and the right citation here. Great. Okay. Now, what about the warning? Um, this document format, HTML, requires a non-empty title element. Well, let's see here. What is the title element? Well, it put here 
the name of the file draft as a title because we didn't specify the title here. What it says is we need a title because an HTML file without a title tag isn't a valid HTML document. That means that we have to put here a title key and a title value. Well, I do it this way. I remove this here and put it here and say title is this one. Okay, so this is what we can do. And now I go ahead here again. No warning. And have a look at this tab. I refresh the page. And now it says here setting up and so on. That's it. Okay, right. Let's inspect the markup again. This is where the title is. This is correct. Well, this is a valid HTML5 page. Great. Okay. Now, we come to something that is very nice and uh, handy. Because, for example, I want to click on the citation and have a link to the um, exact position in the references list which is not so easy to show because we have so little text. So let's build some more text here. Um, let's have here the other things, whatever the other things is, and have some multiple paragraphs. Let's have seven other paragraphs and build the website again and refresh the site. Well, that's it. Okay, good. Uh -huh. So now we have something to scroll. And let's see how this works, how we can have this be linked to the list here. Okay, I scroll to the top. And in fact, it's another metadata information. It is link references. I show you where I got this from. I had to look on my sheet of paper that I prepared for this episode uh, because um, I don't have all the stuff in mind. I have cheat sheets as well, and I'm fine with the cheat sheets because what comes out of it for me is worth having a cheat sheet and not knowing everything by heart. So let's see what this does. I do this again. Okay, let's see. Refresh the page. Um, why is that? Oh, sorry. This was the wrong one here. Um, this is for later. Link citations, true, that's it. Link references is for cross-references. I'm going to show you in a minute or two. It's link citations, I'm sorry. So let's see again, because this is a citation. Now we got it, see here. <clears throat> if you click here, you scroll down. If the list was longer, the scrolling and the positioning would be better. It's not. So if you click here, you scroll down. Well, this is what you get here. <coughs> well, this is nice for for HTML and for online. Um, and as you will see later, it's also nice for PDF files. Uh, but in a minute. Okay, good. Now, um, if we have this, um, we would like to have, uh, for example, cross-references. Um, because usually, not on the internet, if you're in a blog, you will say something about, have a look at the figure below um, or have a look at the figure above, but you don't do this local positioning uh, referencing when you're writing a scientific or a scholarly article or also an educational context. You would call it a figure or um, uh, a table and you would have a cross-reference to this table or to this figure and it's in the text and it's clear it's figure one and the caption says figure one. This is something we need. So how do we get this? First of all, where does it, uh, it has to do with another filter. We have to use another filter, which is Pandoc Crossref. I'm gonna show you in a minute where this comes from, what I show you now. For example, we wanna speak about the, the image in the text. So now comes another uh, bracket type, it's the curly braces, it's these, and we have a uh, hash, and then we say fig, and then we say kitten. So it's a construction of curly braces, 
which is always the same. So if you have a sheet sheet for that, if you once write it down and you put it next to your screen, it's not so complicated. It's just putting down some notes how to how to write some things, and some you will have it. Uh, you will know it very fast. So it is curly braces hash fig um, double colon and kitten. And this is something you can freely decide on. What's the label? And this is something that should be for figures and for tables. It should be different. I show you in the documentation for Pano Crossref. Now, how do we really reference this here? Um, it's the same as using the Pandoc Cita or uh, the Pandoc Citation syntax. But for example, we want to talk about this here. So let's say this is the parenthesis. It's just to have this uh, correctly formatted uh, with with um, parentheses. And now comes um, brackets, and again the at character. And as we use this extension Pandoc Citer, we get suggestions for uh, the two. Um, sources in the references list. We ignore this. We refer, cross refer to fake kitten. And see the difference here is, or the relation is, that here we use the add character and here we use the hash character. This is the relationship between the two. Now, let's see what comes out of that. Aha, uh -huh. it says reference fake kitten not found. Well, this is clear. Let's see what it did here. Well, nothing except for that there is, there should be a, well, where did I put it? I cannot find it here. Ah, I, I put it in the footnote. I didn't want to put it in the footnote. Okay, I cut this. Uh, I want to put it here where I can see it immediately. Okay, right. Generating again, switching. Now, okay, so, and because it cannot find this here, it's, uh, it puts three question marks because the reference is unclear. Now, how do we get the cross references? There is um, another filter for that. It's also excluded from Pandoc. You can easily install it. And as you can see from my preparation for this episode, I have this still open. It's what we did here. So the caption and the file, and then it comes the figure and the label. And as you can see here, it's absolutely a professional thing because you have sub figures, you can have a sub figure grid, and you can have equations and tables. You can cross reference everything as Schola Publishing needs it. Now, how do we combine this with Pandoc Sideproc? And this is something I really, really didn't realize in the first place. It's if you use Pandoc Crossref and Pandoc Sideproc together, you have to stick to a certain order. So at first you put Pandoc Crossref and afterwards the filter Pandoc Sideproc not the other way around. It doesn't work. It doesn't give you an error. It doesn't work. And if, if it doesn't give you an error, you get crazy because you don't know why it doesn't work. All right. So um, let's put this on the command line. So we can repeat this command here, this switch filter. Um, I think it's the same as our bin pandoc crossref. Yes, that was it. So let's see here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So now it says here figure one. And here we refer to figure one. That's good. But uh, perhaps you want to change this uh, for folks writing in the German context and not in the English context. There should be a way to, um, to get this switched here. So one thing is, and uh, let's see what it does, is to switch the language. Um, let's go to the documentation and have a look at the language parameter. Language. 
and uh, well, this is what we need to say in what language we're doing this. Well, it's English, it's fine, but if you want to change this, you should know. So if we do here lang de de like here, and we do this again, let's see what effect this has. Okay, refresh. Um, doesn't have an effect because this cross ref thing doesn't isn't interested in this change. I have to build another example for you to show you the effect of changing the language. I think later with a PDF I can do that. But there's nevertheless there's a way to change this. If you go at the end of this documentation, you can see how you can rename the figure prefixes. So this is what we have here, but if we change this here in the metadata, I put this, um, no, sorry. I change this to, because otherwise I don't see the effect later. If I want, for example, this as a cap capital um, F, and here again, you can see now that you can change the, well, I put this on number one, that's easier. Now you have a, a, a capital F, and um, if it was more than one figs, you have a capital F too. Now this is nice, but now comes something else that I like. It is, um, it is link references is true. So this gives us what I wanted to show before. This gives us a link to the figure. And if you think this little number is too small to have a link, then you say name in link true, which makes the whole cross-reference um, part clickable. It's the link. So as you can see, there is some metadata that you can put in front of your file that gives options to the file. And the idea is that these metadata options um, are for all the files that you might build without changing this. So as you will see, these options here set to true, cause the same in the PDF file. So the idea is this is for all formats. And on the command line, you can have options that might vary for the different formats. This is a little bit special. I don't want to make an example, <coughs> but if you're creating um, two different file types, for example, in a Docker pipeline, an HTML file, and a PDF. You perhaps might want to use another filter for image conversion with a PDF that you don't need for HTML. And if you if this is your um, your target, this is what you want to do. You wouldn't have a chance to put this here because it's something like if else, and you don't put this in the metadata. So this is something that I think is the rule. So um, options that are for Every format come here, go here, and uh, things that might be different from file type to file type go into the command line. Well, this is half true, but it might be something that you can, for the first steps, stick to. Okay, now something to this way of, of working uh, as I showed it. It's always clicking here, updating the file manually, the, the nice refresh feature is gone that we had with uh, Pandoc, um, with Markdown Preview Enhanced, which also used Pandoc, but uh, it was not clear what and why. And um, I can show you, you can put some of these options in Markdown Preview Enhanced, but I think it's not worth doing this. Nevertheless, I want to show you, perhaps you want to start this way. So if you scroll down, Let's
let's see where it is. So you can put some arguments here. Here now, Pandoc arguments. You can put some of these arguments here in this line, but for me this is no way because well it's easy. It might be convenient, but um, I want to see the complete command, and I want to I want to learn what to put here and don't hide it in an option list. But it's possible. You can put the same like standalone here, and you can put the filter here. It works, but I have a better way for myself. Perhaps it's a better way for you. This is possible here. Now, um, I want to have an automated update, which is easy on Linux computers. It's also easy on Mac because there are ways. I don't know how easy it is on Windows, but I want to have an automatic refresh and rebuild of my files when I change something in the text. So let me do this one, this to the side and uh, this to the other side. And now I have some kind of same view like with Markdown Preview Enhanced, which is nice for some starters, but uh, this is the way I do it. Um, I switch off this file list, clear this here, <coughs> and now I show you a tool that is called Enter. Enter is a Linux command. Um, it's running arbitrary commands when files change. It's like a watcher. So whenever something changes, enter, hit, uh, runs a command, whatever it is. And I found out that this is quite handy for this here because now I can do, I list the draft file and the list um, uh, watches for the change. And then I hand this over to enter and let enter do the Pandoc command. So um, I put this here, ls minus d draft dot md, and I pipe this to enter, and enter should do uh, minus r, not starting a new process, recycling the process. Now there's the cursor is waiting, but let's see what happens. So if I change something here, like putting the whole sentence in bold type, nothing happens. <laughs> What's wrong? Ah, okay, right. Ah, I forgot something. Okay. Um, I forgot something. Um, let's go back. Okay. I have to, I have to open this file another way. So as you remember, I opened this file as a local file. I just double clicked an HTML file and it opened up in the browser. So this is where it is. Um, but I have to serve this from a live server. And now it gets really a little bit, well, I would understand if you say, well, what a live server for an HTML? Well, it, it, I think it is related to what I normally do. I write websites. I do um, a lot with static site generators. My teaching is about HTML and to Python and building websites and web applications. So I'm quite used to working with a live development web server on my computer. And I think this is where my writing habits stem from because I this is quite something of my everyday work. Um, just to show you what I, what I do to open up this file. So sorry, I forgot this. Just go back a little bit and then go back to enter. I close this here just to make clear we don't work with this locally open file. We work with a web server now. So let's um, go here again and look for the live server extension. Well, it makes it possible to develop websites locally and um, delivering them with HTTP which makes it possible to develop some fancy JavaScript stuff, which is not possible when you open an HTML file uh, locally, as I did before. So if you install the live server, it's just two clicks. It's install and that's it. Then you get a new function that is in the file tree, right click and open with live server. It does the same as before, just without a double click. And as you can see, <coughs> it opens this from a fake IP address and a port, and this is it. Now, now this is this really is 
um, delivered by a web server, like as if it was a web page on a server. Well, um, the presentation of the website is nothing special. But the thing is that this one here has a live reload. So whenever the HTML changes, this reloads. And the enter command that I have here builds a new HTML file from the markdown file whenever the markdown file changes. So this is a chain of watches. Um, the markdown file changes and uh, my, uh, my operating system says to enter, hey, there's a change in the markdown file. It generates a new HTML file. And the live server extension gets the information, hey, the HTML file has changed and reloads in the browser. Let's see, I think this should work now. Now, so as you can see, this is bold all the way through. Let's take this back and go ahead here. and make this bold and uh, still it doesn't work why now it works but why didn't it work before so I delete this X now it works okay don't know why it it didn't before well let's do something absolutely visible put another headline here and insert some lorem ipsum like three okay there we go so this is my a little bit sophisticated visivuk workflow which as i know how to set it up is quite fast for me it has a lot of, lot of concepts behind that. I understand that. And I would absolutely understand if you said, uh, well, that's too complicated um, because I'm fine with what I have. Um, but my, my argument at the end is, for example, when, when I write for uh, educational purposes, like building open educational resources, um, I usually have a website built with a static site generator and I want also, I want to have a PDF to download. And I like to have the PDF for the students as it is some kind of takeaway for learning or something like that. And um, second thing is, um, I'm in a project uh, doing, dealing with um, ways of modern publishing, which always have to do, which has to do with um, having a single source and building various formats out of it for journal article publishing, which means that, of course, we want to have a PDF, but then we have an HTML file and we want to have an XML file for archiving and for other stuff like uh, um, an analyzing or text mining um, things. So and this, what I'm going to show you now is that we can also have the same file being used for uh, PDF generation. Now, have a look at this file tree. It's just, uh, there's no PDF file. So what I do now is I recycle this command line and instead of generating a HTML document, <coughs> excuse me, ex uh, instead of generating a PDF document, uh, HTML document, I generate a PDF. And uh, everything else I leave like it is now. So. I hit enter and I get a PDF document. So I open this up and show you. And this is what I get from the same source. So we have everything that we had before. So let's make this huge. Let's make this huge. So this is the normal output. It has the footnote, it has the figure, it's linked, it sends me to this figure, it has the citations linked to the list, and it has the links here linked to the web. This is what I get from the same source. You saw that I have not changed anything except for the file extension 
and I got the same out of this. Now let's tinker with this a little bit. This is not um, an A4 paper, so I want to have this um, like uh, paper size. This is something that I need to put here. So paper size is A4. So let's see again. This also works with the watcher. Let's see if this changes. So if I go with this one, now this is A4, as you can see here. Uh, well, this is what it says here. Okay, we're good. Now, what about the margins? Let's have the margins. Um, I put them here because this is nothing that is for HTML. This is something special for PDF. It's, for example, having a variable, minus V is a variable. It's margin margin left. Oh, you cannot see this anymore. I'm sorry. Okay, margin left is two centimeters. What's that? Okay, oh, sorry. Um, that's it. Okay. Right, so this is what you can do with the PDF file. And uh, of course, there still is the HTML file from the same source. So this is this is what you can have. Um, another thing I would like to see in the PDF file, which is easy to have, is color links. True. And if we do this, we get a clear hint where we can click even in the PDF file. And, um, right, this is it. Um, now something, let's have another one, links as notes, true. This gives me every hyperlink as a footnote automatically, which is not true for the HTML. There we have the links, still the links. Well, that's it. And um, this is the basics, I think. It's the basics. Let me look at my list. This is what I showed you. Mm, all right. Well, that's it. This is what I prepared. So um, let's go back and have a look here to get a conclusion of that. Well, the conclusion is up to you, but uh, just to put some names on the things. This is the, the YAML front matter, where you can put lots of options from the filters and from Pandoc. You will find them in the reference on the website. I put Make this huge again. So this is your friend if you want to learn what you can do. And, uh, well, I could make a whole episode about this one page. There's a lot of things. I would suggest that you start writing, and whenever you have a problem, you go to this reverend reference here and see if you get uh, a solution for your problems. And uh, if you go and dive into this, um, just write me some tweet or whatever and tell me your problem. Perhaps I can help you. Next thing is, um, we have cross-references. So for cross-references, we have another documentation website. It's this one here. It's for Pandoc Crossref. And it makes us cross-referencing figures and tables and code snippets and whatever. And uh, finally, we have um, Pandoc Sideproc involved, which is another filter that makes it easy for us to cite and build a reference list, as you can see here at the bottom. And uh, there were three extensions for VS Codium involved. The first one was Markdown Preview Enhanced, which gives us this nice preview on the right-hand side, which is now the correct one. Uh, ah, okay, you see here, I haven't put this cross-reference thing in here. Um, I will do this immediately so that it works. 
Second extension was Pandoc Citer, which made it possible to have a selector for your references here. And immediately this gets written down with the parameters that we have here. And, well, of course, this is not double here, but you saw this before. This is Pandoc Citer. And the third one, and this might be a little bit too much, um, as you might think, is the live server extension, which makes it easy for me to have an HTML file as I would send it away and live reload it and stuff. If you don't want this step, of course, you can go with Markdown Preview Enhanced, which also has the possibility of um, putting some arguments for the command line in this field that I showed you uh, somewhere. Let's see, argue. Well, here it is. Pandoc arguments. You can put this here. So, and if I put here filter Pandoc, well, use our bin Pandoc cross ref. I hope that this works. Uh, filter Pandoc cross ref. What is that? Ah. Pando cross ref. I'm not sure. Perhaps it's because of the the order Pandoc site proc uh, with a comma. Nope. Not sure. Um, I want, I don't want to spend time on this here at the end of this episode. I think I can find this out, but as I showed you before, uh, my, my favorite thing to do is to put this on the command line. And if you want to, if you want to keep this, an easy way is to just store it in a text file and, uh, reuse it, just copy and paste it on the command line if you don't have this by heart. Um, I could show you another way. Let me see how many people have left, <laughs> how many people are watching. Um, well, there's, there are some people watching. Um, okay, so let me add this because I have another way that is something like live preview, but it's then it's not. Um, because Sometimes I don't want to have a live reload for a PDF because perhaps your computer is not that strong and uh, always generating a new PDF after you type three characters is perhaps not what you want. <clears throat> so um, auto-generation of a longer document like a book or a master thesis is perhaps not what you want. So you want a manual way of updating your, um, your PDF or, or regenerating your P PDF or your HTML website. Mm. There is a cool way. So let's get rid of everything that we have here on the right-hand side. Um, let's get rid of the live server. So I switch this off and I close this website here because now I'm going to do something else. It's not live reloading really, but if you use um, a PDF generation um, and you have, for example, a Linux or a Mac system, I think it works on Mac too, PDF files that change while they're open will update themselves in the, in the viewer. I don't know if Adobe Acrobat does this, but on Linux, that's no problem. You update a PDF that is, uh, is open and it gets refreshed automatically, which is fine, which is some kind of live reload function. Now, what I want to show you is putting everything that I have here into another file. And the advantage is that I have a file that I can reuse in the next project. So let's build here um, the build script. Well, 
it's build.sh, which means it's a shell script, which is quite common on Mac and Linux, and which also works on um, Windows, but with some differences that I cannot talk about here. But I tried it out, it works. It's the same workflow. I have a colleague I do this uh, together with, and she has a build script for Windows. Now, what I'm going to put in here is, this is uh, bin bash, this is the shebang, and it says, do this following thing with, um, with the bash, which is the, the, the program for the command line. So I copy this and paste this here. And now I have to do something um, that is uh, Linux related. I have to make this build script executable, which means I want to execute it, um, which is not possible before. So now I execute this file, see if it works. And what it does, it builds my PDF file. So let's see if this is true. I move this to the left hand side. Sorry. Oh. I close the editor. Why? Open it again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's go again. Well, that is. What did I do wrong? Okay, now here's the PDF file again. And now let's see what happens if I change something here. And let's erase this first word, voluptate, and replace it by aliqua with a capital A. And now let's see what happens here on the right-hand side if I execute again the build script. Aha! Uh -huh. As you can see here, it built the PDF and refreshed the viewer. This is what I want. But of course, I don't want to go back to the same thing as before, uh, like uh, like uh, clicking into the terminal and reuse the command and doing this again. I don't want this. And there's a shortcut in VS Codium for that that I really like. It's initiated by Shift Control B. If I do this, you can see this here on top. Sorry, let's do this again. Control Shift B asks me about a build task to run. So Control Shift B is what you need afterwards as a shortcut to trigger your build process. So if you go to run, um, you can have here um, uh, the same thing. So I don't know where this is. Control. Ah, oh, this is it. Ah, okay, run build task. Sorry, it is terminal. Run build task, not run. Okay, terminal. So, Control Shift B is the shortcut for running our build script. We have to configure this. It's not difficult, hopefully. So, Control Shift B, and there is no build task. Configure build task. So, I hit enter to configure the build task. I need a task JSON file from a template which is VS Codium related. I hit enter again. This is the suggestion for MS Build, for Maven, for .NET, nothing of these, others. I want another example, please, another example. So now it gives me this here, and I open this up, I, I zoom into this one here, no, other way, this one here. Okay, um, and here you see the type is uh, a shell command. This is the shell. And the label is something human readable, build the article. And here we have the command. This is what we did manually. We want to encapsulate this in the run script in the run task here. So now let's get back to the draft MD. If I hit again Shift Control B, it asks me about the run task again. I hit enter and then I get the suggestion of my build task. And this is what I want. So I hit enter again. 
And this is my build task. And hopefully this works now. It does. So whenever I hit Control Shift B, it executes whatever is in my build script. So if I want to add something to this parameter list, like minus V, margin, right, also two centimeters, and I go again with Shift Control B, gets ex executed, and the parameters get used again. So this is something that can be uh, can be done for reusing things. And I think the final thing that I want to show you in in uh, talking about re reusability of what of the complete thing that you do here is. Um, getting rid of the YAML front matter in this file. So let's have a, a final file, which I always call pandocconfig.yaml. I put a dot at the beginning to make sure this is something hidden or something configuration-like. Um, and into this file, I do everything from this YAML front matter. I cut this and I paste this here and I clean the space here. So now comes um, a, new, a new thing here, because before we use the markdown file that we want to convert, we need to, uh, we need the content of the config.yaml. So let's see if this works. Just the same. So what we've won is that everything here gets reusable. So the, um, the build script you can use for your next article and the Pandoc config YAML is something that travels with you. So when, whenever you have set this up the correct way, um, you, can, you can use it for your, um, for your next project. And the magic is here you can have various files chained one after the other in the row, and the first file can be the file with the YAML front matter. This is what I do. I've read in the documentation of Panoc that there's a new way of putting some defaults somewhere, but I haven't uh, tinkered with that, so I don't know how this works. This works for me. This is my way how I do it. And, uh, well, um, this is it. Uh, there's one thing left. I think this is the language stuff. So let's have here something like um, like uh, date. Uh, I think I can show you with the date. The date is today. Does that work? Yeah, it works. So this is the latex command for um, the date of today. But if I change this here to de DE, and I go again with shift Control b you see here it takes care of the right date format because it knows how to tell LaTeX to use the German uh, format for dates. Well, I think that's it. Well, that was a long episode. Um, hopefully you had some fun with this stuff. I want to really encourage you to Think around with Pandoc. It doesn't have to get so complicated, but if you convert something like uh, um, your Markdown to an HTML file, or for example, you have a HackMD pad and you download the Markdown and you convert the Markdown to a Word document or a PDF to persist this or to give this to your students, whatever you can use it for. Pandoc is a great tool to convert between a free and open and agnostic format like Markdown and uh, build versions, other versions out of it. So um, whenever you think you have something to add, to, to, uh, to ask, go ahead, uh, write me a tweet or write me a mail or whatever channel you want to get uh, to me. That's fine. I'm happy about that. I'm going to up upload this episode on Vimeo and on YouTube. And whenever you want to see something again, uh, go back and uh, try this out. Um, 
it took me some time to figure this out and I think it's very special, but I think there are many things inside that can be automated, that can be very helpful for open science and for open educational resources stuff. And um, yeah, if you, if you think about this the same or differently, I'd like to share uh, I want to. Um, I'd like to know what uh, what you think about this, and if you share your thoughts with me, I'd be happy. Well, so have a good night or day wherever you are, and uh, hope to see you next time.